Hello and welcome to this episode of Nucleus Wealth in Power, where I, Shelley George, Head of Operations at Nucleus Wealth, go looking for what the good life is and how finance can support and empower us in achieving that. Uh, so I'd like to start today in the spirit of reconciliation by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So today I'm joined by my colleague Damien Classen, Head of Investments at Nucleus Wealth, to help try and illuminate for some of those that find them a bit puzzling the Nucleus Wealth performance reports and more generally investment performance. Welcome Damien. Thanks Shelley. A quick reminder before we get started, if you haven't already, subscribe and click the notification bell to be notified when we go live or have a new webinar to watch or follow us on your preferred podcast platform. We also ask if you could take a moment to click like on the video now to help our show grow. So turning to today's episode, what I wanted to try and do was give people who don't know much about uh, investing and don't have a great deep understanding of what a professional in investment manager does, an idea of how they go about constructing investment portfolios. Um, I know over my time uh, working in finance and sitting in investment management meetings, I sort of have thought of uh, an investment portfolio as a sort of um, spiky sort of 3D object that you look at from different angles and you see how um, things happening in the world flow through and affect that portfolio from the different angles. Uh, so we're going to start by looking at that construction and then use the framework that we have for portfolio construction to talk about in particular Nucleus Wealth's uh, March performance report. So uh, next slide please Jaden, thank you. So what I've listed here um, is a list I don't think it's complete, but it is definitely extensive, of some of the things that you consider, um, some of these angles of this 3D object that is a portfolio you consider when you're looking at it. So I thought, let's start at the very top with asset allocation. Mm. Um, no, so not all uh, investments will uh, have uh, an asset allocation uh, that they'll talk about, but they will all have an asset allocation in that if it's an equity fund, it means it's got a zero allocation to bonds and cash and that mm. sort of thing. So do you want to talk us through the assets? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the key things when, as we're trying to put together these portfolios is, is trying to look at what we call asymmetrical bets. So they're the bets where um, you take a bet on it, you can see some upside and you can see that the downside not so, is, is not that dramatic. And so a lot of investment is really about trying to put together portfolios in that way. You know, we'd all love to be able to get every single call right every single time, but the reality is you can't. And also markets will move in different directions. They're not quite sure whether, um, you know, one theme is going to be the dominant theme. And so you might see, you know, right now we'll see tech stocks outperform one day and underperform the next day and, and sort of a bit of back and forth. And so you, you can't be expected to, to, to get every single time, but what you want to, what you want to make sure is that, um, if you do make mistakes, that those mistakes aren't going to cost you um, dearly in your portfolio. And we've seen a few sort of hedge funds blow up recently using, um, uh, so games, there was a GameStop, so Melvin Capital was one of those ones where they'd taken some really big, um, what's called short positions in it. And when those went wrong, you know, that blew up large parts of their portfolio. Another one, uh, Archegos, I think it is Archegos? Name. Archegos? I think I might have heard Bloomberg yeah. say that. Way, so um, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it, but they basically took some 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 big bets on stocks, but then they used debt to really leverage up their positions. Mm -hmm. And so when the stocks went the, the opposite way, they actually end up blowing up the, the entire fund. And so for us, <coughs> putting together a portfolio is about avoiding those types of issues where you're you're so heavily weighted towards one theme that if, if it goes against you. Um, the whole thing's going to come unstuck. That's it, it's finished. So, so yeah, so you want to try and say, I'm going to, I, I, I can see where we think the future is going. We're going to take bets in that direction, but I need to make sure I've got enough other things in the portfolio that if it goes the wrong way, um, it's it's not quite going to cost the, uh, you know, it's not going to cost you everything. Yeah. Okay. There's so much to unpack there, but I'm going to re, re ask the question. Mm. Can you tell us what your definition of the different asset classes is for oh, those okay. who don't know? Yeah, sure. So, so the the key ones, um, the key big ones, is uh, is is equities. So, um, and that's 
where you're buying, so you're buying into a company um, and you're, you're taking the, uh, the most amount of risk, but you're gonna get the most amount of return from it. Um, so that's ownership, right? That's you're actually buying a tiny portion of ownership in a company. Right? Yep. Exactly, okay. yes. And so um, a company will, will they'll make their sales, uh, they'll, they'll pay their employees and costs, uh, then they'll pay the debt holders, then they'll pay the government in terms of taxes, and whatever's left, the whole amount goes to you as a shareholder. And, and it could be negative, so you know, shareholders have to put more money in, but um, if it's positive, and it's often quite positive to, 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 uh, to, to reward shareholders for taking the most amount of risk. Okay. And then you sort of start going back up the the um, uh, the investment structure is you can get cor what's called corporate debt, and there's a whole bunch of different types of corporate debt. Um, the two most common ones um, are seen as being the high yield corporate debt, which is the really risky stuff. Uh, companies that may well, very well go broke, and um, and then sort of uh, in what's called investment grade corporate debt, and those uh, investments will pay you higher. Um, higher return in terms of your interest rate, but you don't have that, that significant upside. So, so you, basically you might get an interest rate, say at the moment of four or five percent, which is really good, much higher than what you can get in the bank and, and all those things, but you are taking a big risk and you're, you're not gonna make any more than four or five percent. You're gonna, and the risk yeah. is that if, if you're holding this thing to maturity, the risk is the company actually goes broke and you end up with, with, a, with a, a negative return on it. Okay, um, so let's, before, I actually wanna talk about that, um, the risk and the, because that's an asymmetric return, but the opposite way almost that you wanna exactly. take it. Before we get into that, um, can we just explain at a high level, uh, like debt, how that works? So if you invest in debt, tell me if this is right. Uh, if I invest in a debt product, what I am doing is lending money to that company. So for equity, I'm taking an ownership stake in the company, yep. and for debt, I'm lending the money. Exactly. Okay, and so when you talk about high yield versus investment grade, um, again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in the way that you, I guess actually, so stepping back into debt and equity, um, it's really important to think about them in terms of like when the, not when, if the entity uh, has to close down, it goes bankrupt, mm. then these investments, they have a hierarchy within that, right? Yes. So, and that hi hierarchy refers to who gets returned the money first, the stakeholders who will get paid out first. Yep. And equity is generally right at the bottom, right? Yep, they're the last one to get the money back. And that's why, is, is that the only reason or is it just one of the reasons why equity is typically the most riskiest for, one of the more risky forms of investment? Yeah, that's that's the main one. There's not a legal obligation to, to actually have to pay dividends. There's not a legal obligation to okay. have to give the money back. Okay, So whereas when you loan some, when you loan company money as an investment, mm -hmm. they actually, there's a contract there that says we have to make these interest payments back yes. to you. So yeah. th that's a legal agreement and that you're talking about. Yeah, and the issue with the debt is, uh, as you spoke, there's, you can have lots of different levels of debt, junior debt and senior debt. And so basically what, what can happen is you can have debt where the company owes you the money, but then depending upon how the, it's been structured, you might find later on that they've actually gone and borrowed some more money from, from somebody else and they're more senior to you. So if the company goes broke, that more senior debt might actually get yeah. their money first yeah. before you even get any of your money. And so, so typically investment grade debt, which you just said is less risky, is typically more senior? Yep, and and um, or, or either more senior or in companies that are a lot more stable and, and have a lot less debt. Okay. So that's... Um, so it's a combination? Yeah, it's a combination of the two and um, and then that investment grade debt you know you might at the moment you might be getting sort of two or three percent returns okay. on on that whereas you might be able to get four or five percent on some of the higher you more know, risky higher, more risky stuff okay the high um, yield yep yeah and so um, so that's the corporate debt the next part is the government debt mm -hmm. now depending upon how you're investing in government debt I tend to take the view that um, governments do occasionally default so they do occasionally not pay their their um, the money that they've borrowed, but it is almost exclusively they default on um, uh, foreigners. They don't like to vote on on, on voters, and yep. they want to keep their their markets open. So, um, have you, you got know, an example of the last time a government defaulted on on voters on their own on, on, their, own on their own currency debt? Uh, I'm not sure. There's certainly. Um, Possibly Argentina. Uh, actually, I don't think Argentina. I think Argentina defaulted on mainly foreigners. Okay. Um, yeah, well, yeah, we'll see if we can find one and put yeah, in the show notes. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, but but so so if you're investing in international other other governments' debts, 
then uh, there is the risk of default. But if you're investing in your own country and um, your country owns a printing press and can do its own, can print its own currency, which Australia does and, and the UK does and the US does, um, then the chance of them actually defaulting is very, very low because okay. they can effectively just print some more money and, and give it to people. So they can, de- they can sort of effectively de- default by running really high levels of inflation. You'll still get your money back. But you're still getting your actual money back. It's a, so, so that's seen as basically the lowest risk asset, which is the buying government bonds. Okay. Okay. And so just to clarify that point on they could effectively default by running high inflation, I think Mm. what you mean there is that you'll get your money back, Mm. but you won't be able to buy as much with it as if they hadn't run high inflation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So so generally they've got a face value of $100. So you you buy it for $100, they'll pay you a you know, 1% or 2% interest rate for the next 10 years, and then at the end of it, they're going to give you $100 back. You'll get that $100 most likely. Um, But maybe in the meantime, yeah, $100 used to be able to buy you a, you know, a night out on the town and now you Price get half, half a night. night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to go home at 12 o'clock instead of 5 a.m. Yes. Um, That's not half a night for me. Half a night's going home at <laughs> <laughs> 9, 8, 9 p.m. rather than... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so before we move off the government debt, just to clarify, so or to summarise maybe, um, you're saying that the safest way to invest in government debt is the um, government of which you are a voting citizen in the currency uh, of that country of which you're a citizen. Yeah, so you're not running any currency risk and your, your default risk is very, very, very low, almost okay. almost equitable. Yep. And so for, for, the, for us, for the large part, what we, what we try and do, so we're, we're only managing the higher quality assets. So in terms of the equities, we only manage the, the, the really big um, stocks and we, and we screen them very much for quality and value to make sure that we're getting sort of the blue chip ones at the lowest risk okay. versions. And, and, we, and we invest in the government debt and um, in, in the stocks, we'll, we'll choose between international and Australian stocks. Yep. And so our idea very much in Nucleus is the idea we, we've got this core portfolio which um, is your sort of your safer sleep at night type stuff. So it's high quality shares, it's high quality bonds, it's not stuff that you can you need to worry about as much as, as, as other assets. With the idea that then if investors do want to get some more excitement and, and have you know, some Argentinian debt to get you some great yields or at the risk of losing or, or if you want to buy small cap stocks or um, small yeah, small stocks that might be a lot more volatile or you want to buy hedge funds or, or distressed okay. debt, you can do that around that, knowing that you've got that sort of core holding that's, that's there to try and you know, keep the, the, the value of your assets uh, relatively safe. Yep. Okay, so do we want to just briefly talk about this uh, risk and return trade-off that sort of is so central to financial theory? Because uh, we've talked a lot about risk, mm. um, but why... like. <coughs> I mean, if we just talk about by itself, I have the question, why would I take on more risk um, in investing just than just have less? Yeah, sure. So the idea is um, if you take on a risk, you should be getting a return for it. And that that doesn't exist for every asset, but but in in general it does across. Um, if you invest in equities, you end up getting a much higher return in the long term than if you invested in cash or, or bonds, uh, or um, in the short term bonds or, or long term bonds. So if you look over sort of a hundred years of, of data, um, there's very clear um, pattern that you sort of get in cash. You sort of get inflation ish returns. And then as you start sort of stepping up the bonds, you, you'll get you know, slightly higher than inflation. And then once you get to equities, you sort of tend to get uh, you know, maybe 4% above inflation as your, okay. four or 5% above inflation as, as, your, um, as your target for, for that. Mm. Okay. So, uh, yes. The, so so we, we want to invest in equities because it can give us a higher return, basically. Yeah. But well, that if, comes at a cost. Exactly. If you have the tolerance for it. So the question for us is saying, and then we sort of will run um, surveys on people as they come in to, to basically go, well, how much, if, if you're sort of sitting there going, look, I've got a, a fixed amount of money, I'm not going to be making any more, this is what I need, this is what needs to last me to retirement and it's only just going to make it, mm-hmm. um, then you much lot more, will be much more likely to put you into quite a low risk okay. and, and have lots of bonds, you won't have, you won't get the same upside, but um, it's it's protecting your downside, mm. and and especially as we're what we're really trying to do is again that safe core nucleus of your assets. Yep. Um, that's where, we, where our focus is, and then for um, for people who you know have, have can tolerate more risk because they've got a longer time frame. So yep. if you're, we're talking to a, a thirty year old with the same 
uh, money as a yep. as a seventy year old, we're much more likely to put the the thirty year old into um, into some equities because if there is a drawdown of ten, twenty, thirty percent in one year, you can make that back over mm. over the longer term. Yep. Whereas for somebody who's um, you know closer to uh, or who's in retirement and needs that money to survive on, yep. it's, it's it's much uh, much more risky, obviously, to to be at yeah. the, the mercy of the market. Okay. Um. So I think risk tolerance, that's a great one to, to dive into with Tim maybe in a later episode. Mm. Um, there's obviously actually quite a lot un underlying that. Time is a really great one, mm. uh, but there's other stuff as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah make, sure, make sure you do I'm going to research. preempt your question. So, so what we've talked about here is the asset allocation. So, so now what really matters now when you're looking at um, performance, if you're looking at somebody's performance report, what you really care about is what is their asset allocation? Mm -hmm. Because um, if you're looking at somebody who's invested only in international stocks, they will tend to be more volatile than somebody who's in Australian stocks, mm -hmm. um, or if you're looking at uh, somebody who's using cash and bonds and equities. So if you look at our different portfolios, um, say this month our, our income portfolio was up 1% and our growth portfolio is up 3.7%. Now that's because the income portfolio is positioned for people who are um, who have got a, a, a need for, for more stability. Mm -hmm. And so the actual volatility of that portfolio was very low in terms of, you know, it basically just edged, edged its way up over the period, whereas the, the growth portfolio was a, a bit more volatile, um, certainly nowhere near as volatile as, as say, our, our international portfolio that yep. was up sort of over 5% for the for the month. But it's a, it's a matter of saying, well, you know, measuring the amount of risk that's necessary okay. because the portfolio that, that was up 5 or 6% could easily be down, you know, uh, yeah, three or four percent next month. Yep. If, if markets happen to move in the wrong direction, whereas the income portfolio is very, very unlikely to fall um, sort of large amounts in any one month. Okay. Uh, okay. So I noticed you just started using this term volatility. Mm. Uh, do you use that? Is it the same thing as risk, or it's related? Okay. It's, it's closely related. So, so because some people do use them interchangeably. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think that the key thing is the volatility is what we're talking about here is is how much the share price or price of the the bond goes up and down in any one month or or, or, or week or year. Um, the issue with the volatility is that it's you're actually looking at an outcome. So what you're looking at is saying so so when I look at a stock, for example, I think of a stock's volatility as turn, as how um, how volatile the earnings or dividends from that stock. And if you've got a stock with particularly volatile earnings or dividends, then that should manifest itself in a, in a volatile share price. But the volatile share price is is an outcome. It's not what's. It's not the actual underlying volatility of yeah. the stock. That's that's that's. Or the asset there. even. Yes. Because I guess uh, property is another one that you can look at that typically is seen as not being very volatile at all, and that's actually sometimes more of a function of the fact. That doesn't trade that much, and it's very unique. One house can't necessarily be compared to another, or commercial Absolutely. houses. Yeah. Okay. So, so very much think of price as being a, and we, we actually in our in our models we run those separately. We have we have a, a price stability where we look at all the different price stability metrics, mm -hmm. and then we have an earnings stability uh, where we look okay. at all the earnings stability and. You know, we both of them are important. We look for we look for t places where they're in where they don't match up to try and work out well, which one's right, which one's wrong, and so maybe there's opportunities to buy or sell. But um, yeah, they're definitely two. We we, we would ordinarily we would um, uh, default back to the the earnings volatility and the cash flow volatility as being the the, the one which we care most about. Okay. Yeah, as opposed to the right, share price, as opposed to the share price. Okay. Yeah, because so. But been... as an investor, mm. if you're not looking at the earnings and cash flow volatility, you're just going to see day to day that price volatility in your portfolio. So yes, I guess it is great for you to make us aware mm. that there are those different volatility metrics that can be related, but might not be as yeah. well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you definitely preempted my question because I was going to put it at the end. <laughs> uh, on the slide here, I, uh, I'm just saying that, when, you know, when you're comparing different investments and the performance of them, uh, you, you want to be comparing apples with apples. Mm. I mean, these aren't the same apples. And, but, and so, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was a joke. Yes. <laughs> Maybe a um, the, uh, and, and so the benchmark's very important. So, so knowing what do you, what's the benchmark that, and is it, is it an appropriate benchmark? So there's two okay. parts to it. One is... Um, so, for example, in our international portfolios, we benchmark ourselves to a portfolio called the MSCI World Index, mm -hmm. and that is a um, that's a benchmark that 
has the top 1,600 stocks in the world, which is about top 60 or 70 Aussie stocks, and um, yeah, very similar to the, the well, that's 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 the universe we're choosing from when we're looking for stocks. So, okay. so for us, that sort of fits. Um, if we chose a different benchmark, say um, uh, like a small cap version, yeah, um, then that for uh, that probably wouldn't be appropriate because we're not actually buying small cap global stocks, or if we, or if we chose the, the ASX and said, oh, okay, we're going to benchmark ourselves to the ASX, for, for that international, that's not really appropriate because yeah. it's, it's a different universe. Yeah, and, and they so, have very different characteristics. Exactly. That's what we're about to move on. But before we move on um, to, to the characteristics, benchmarks. So this is really important. Um, and I think that before I did my commerce degree, I was sort of scratching my head about what is the S&P 500, the ASX 200, what do they all mean? Uh, I guess my really simplified way of doing, of explaining it would be, and this isn't exactly right, it's approximately right. Uh, it's basically a summation of the share prices of the, the stocks in, in that index. Do you have a better way, a maybe more accurate way of describing it? No, that's, that's yeah. The, 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 really, the, the really accurate way is you take the share price and how many shares are out there and multiply them together, and that gets you the, the total size yep. of the company. Then you actually cut out any um, uh, corporate shareholders, yep. and then that's how big it is as part of it. So, so for example, if you're looking at Amazon, for example, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd add up the, the, total, the total value, the, the stock, uh, sorry, the share price, total number of shares out there, you, then you take away Jeff Bezos' shares because you say, well, okay. he's, he's actually a corporate shareholder and he's not actually out trading that. Yeah, in the you market. can't actually access that. Yeah, he's, and so you cut out all his shares and, and maybe a few of the other insiders, and then that's the size of the Amazon as part of the uh, S&P 500 index, say. Okay. So if the ASX uh, 200 goes up today, that means the value of all of those stocks underneath it has gone up. Yeah. Or if it goes down, yep. the total summed value has gone down across yes. everything. Yes, and and that can hide some, and especially over the last year, that's hidden some of the other some of the things that are actually going yeah. on within the market. Yeah. So so last year was all very much growth stocks, and that's what we spend a lot of the talking about is this week's this year this month's yep. Uh, yep. reviews. Just that yeah, growth stocks had a really good run last year, but Come November, um, you know, the story very much changed, and then it was all about value and cyclical stocks, um, you know, which have been performing w really well. So, despite the market itself being up, it's different components of the market that have been performing well, and that's where you're know, trying to trying to work out how much of your portfolio to, to allocate to those different ones has, yep. has really been what's been important. Okay, perfect. So, Jaden, can we go back to slide three, please? That's where, for me, that's where this spiky 3D object comes in in terms of looking at in all of these different ways. So, under security selection, the first seven are yours that you use to uh, analyze the exposures within the portfolio and, and understand across all of it, what, what are you actually exposed to, which risks. Mm. And then the eighth one style exposure is what you were just explaining to us about growth and value. So do you want to quickly define growth and value? Yeah, so this, this, is all, this comes from MSCI um, definitions of how they look at, uh, and the MSCI provides some of these indexes and, and just does calculations about how to divide stocks and what? So they've got basically three different options. You can okay. be a um, a value stock, which tends to mean you're you're cheap. Um, you can be a quality stock, which tends to mean you you're making good returns on your um, on the assets that you have, and and you're earning quite high margins. Okay, so a good return is if you have um, a factory somewhere, a plant, something building something and you're making um, you know like six percent on it or exactly ten percent probably good. Is yeah, that that's what you yeah. So they've, somebody's invested hundred dollars in it and the, in one company they're earning back ten dollars a year and another company they're earning back two dollars a year. Yeah perfect and okay, so okay, so good. So the company that's earning back for the hundred dollars investment you're earning back ten dollars a year is, is the good yeah. And so um, yeah and so what the, what they tend to say is Growth is basically anything left over. Oh, so, right. oh, so it's, that's it's along so the like, unintuitive. Yeah, and, and and the way they put together, there's there's lots of issues with the way they put it together. But but the idea is that um, if you're buying a company, you're either getting it for cheap or you're buying you're paying um, more money because you're buying because you're getting a quality company. Um, and if and if if it's neither, if your company is neither cheap nor good quality, then it, then you must be buying it because you think it's going to grow. Is basically the, the the logic they're using to get there. Okay, so, right. Okay. Um, but but yeah, you, you would think that 
from, from someone you start standing with back. growth as opposed to growth for, being for the someone standing over. back you go oh, well this must be a company that is growing but but growth is such a it's a very nebulous concept sure. and how to get to it and, and so that's that's how they've they're sort of that's the the remainder effectively um, we tend to look at things a bit differently um, but uh, you know I think if, if you're seeing growth versus value elsewhere that's well generally that's what people are um, I feel like when I'm reading press about uh, style, so value or growth stocks. Uh, I, ne- I never read much about quality. No, you don't see as much about it. Um, Quality's had a v- had a very good run from 2016 to 2020 ish. Uh-huh. So it does it does quite well in in sort of low growth environments, um, and so disinflation, and that's where um, yeah, that's where the the quality stocks really um, come to the fore. The ones that can keep yeah, just get, getting those good returns, um, okay. and so. Uh, yeah, so we we run a mix between quality and value because we think both of them have their both of them have their their, their days in the sun, and it's they're both different bets as well. Like a quality, when you're taking a bet on quality, you're basically saying I'm buying a company because I think uh, that's high quality because I think it's going to keep being high quality. Mm-hmm. So you're making a bet on no mean reversion. Whereas okay. when you're so you're saying this is I'm buying this and that's where it's going to be, and then for a value stock, you're actually buying a stock and saying, okay, it's cheap right now, but I don't think it's going to be cheap in the future, and so yep, you are betting okay. it's going to go back to average. Okay. And so right. um, there's actually a quite a, a neat, um, you know, uh, disconnect between those that actually mean if you sort of combining them together in a portfolio, it actually gives you. Um, so some extra it actually this, reduces the volatility of your portfolio. And this asymmetrical upside skew. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's the idea, and it gives us that that scope to say um, it, times like the last month where most of our performance came from our value stocks. Okay. And so we bought a number of stocks in there, things like cement makers, which are, are not high quality stocks. You know, they they don't earn massive margins. Um, they they do go get volatile over the cycles, mm-hmm. but they're generally very pretty cheap. And you pick them at the right point of the cycle, and just you. You know, as as you're getting big stimulus globally, um, you know they can perform quite well. Okay. And so, yep. um, whereas uh, you know at the at the start of last year, uh, or, or certainly during the during the virus, um, we were very much focused on on the quality end about saying if we're buying the quality stocks, they're the ones that are going to hold up better in, in in terms of the downturn. The ones that the bigger margins, so that when sales drops, they're still actually making a profit versus the right. the other ones, which when sales drop, they actually end up being loss making. Okay. And, and you worry about whether the company will last. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm conscious of time. That's why I'm hesitating. But I do actually want to go through those others under security selection. Do you want to start yeah, there sure. with the sector industry and, and work so, your way down? Yeah. So, so for for my part, um, and these none of these ones are, are that easy to find. These tend to need. Analytics to go through. We actually do need to go through stock by stock and, and look at what they do and where they where they're earning the money, because for me it's very important to to get back to to, to actually why you own a stock. Um, and so the business model is is one where we look at saying, okay, does this company make its money from um, say owning a factory which then produces widgets and that's where they they make the money from, um, or is it because they've actually created some some intellectual property mm-hmm. and um, all they're really doing is licensing that to other people and so they're actually not making anything themselves. They're just a they own the intellectual property yes. and they're just licensing it out. Um, do you, do you, actually, is it worth, before you keep going, to introduce this idea of uh, competitive advantage? Um, or is this maybe not necessary is, in the context of this? Maybe, maybe on some of the, one of the later ones. Okay, sure. So let, let me talk about, a, say, a, a healthcare stock, because this is probably where um, some of these really come into it. Okay. So you can have a, a biotechnology stock which, uh, or a healthcare stock that, that owns a patent to a... Um, uh, they, they created the drug, say it's a vaccine, mm-hmm. and so but they've licensed it to somebody else to um, to actually produce it. So, and they just get paid this royalty fee. So that's that's one way of making money. Is this um, what we're ha- seeing at the moment with the um, COVID vaccines? Yes. Okay. So there yeah. are some that have just so found the formula and they've licensed that to someone yeah, else. Yeah, it's Pfizer it. and BioNTech. I think so. BioNTech's the one that found oh, it, I see. and they're that's licensing what the it. To, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you go. Um, uh, and then, then you so you've got somebody manufacturing it, which has got a, a makes a makes a margin on that. Okay. Um, and then then you've got the distribution of it. So um, some places have these big distribution networks into hospitals and pharmacies and and doctors. So it's like and, a and sales lots. force that have to go out and explain to everyone. Exactly. And so for those ones, and so knowing where your value lies. So if I've got somebody who's only got these these royalties, I need to be really careful about knowing when they're going to run out. Okay. If I'm looking at a company that has these big sales forces that actually push into it, then I don't care as much because 
they're just going to buy the next, they can go out and buy the smaller companies. It's like your Pfizer's who can go out and buy these smaller companies and they can push them through either their own manufacturing or they can push them through their own distribution network. And so when I buy a company, I want to know what I'm getting. Because if I look at it, someone who's, who's only owns the royalty side of it, mm. they should be earning massive margins. They got, they've already spent the money on, on R&D. Mm. Now they're just collecting, the, um, the, you know, they're collecting their royalty check. Like so, they shouldn't really have a big cost. So margin is basically revenue minus costs, right? That's yes. kind of your profit. Yep. And the reason you're saying that they should be earning massive margins because they've already spent the money is that they've costed that out in a previous period. Yep. So now what are their costs? The next exactly. project maybe. Yeah, exactly. They're just collecting their check. And then um, and then the manu- then so yeah, so knowing where you're getting that from because if you own a manufacturing part, then you need to have invested in your, you need to have actually invested a lot of money in that. And so um, you'll have these depreciation charges of your of your equipment and everything like that that's sort of depreciate. Does R&D time. depreciate? Um, depend, you can either it write depends. it off okay, and, right. or, or depreciate, yeah. Company, sure. um, but the, the idea is that I need to be looking at those companies differently because they, they, I can handle a lower margin on those ones and I can look at what the capex costs and things like that are. Whereas if, if they've actually outsourced all their manufacturing to somebody else, then they should be earning higher margins. And so it's not just about saying, are you high margin or low margin? It's about saying, are you high margin or low margin for what you're actually doing? Yeah, okay. Yeah, mm. I, so it's relative. It's everything's relative, yeah. Because otherwise, you turn around, and you start looking, and you say, "I just want to have companies that are any high margins." Oh, just a minute, I've got all these companies that are just own royalties or just doing services or something like that, mm. and I've, I've missed this whole basket of companies that are actually earning lower margins, but they're, they're earning lower margins because that's that's the nature of their business. Mm. It's, it's an accounting sort of, but but they might be earning high margins relative to other people in their their industry. Yeah, so they're doing it better, maybe mm. you can say. Yeah. Um, okay, so the problem with just focusing, for example example, as you said, on high margins is that that can, again, as you said, uh, you can be in just one sort of area, invest in one area, and yep. um, that there's risks attached with just and being yes. invested in this one area. And, and you might have thought that you're, you might think you're diversified because you've got, um, you know, I've got some energy, st- I've got some stocks that are in the energy sector, and I've got some stocks that are in the property sector, and I've got some stocks that are in the manufacturing sector and all that. But if you've done this screen to pull out um, things on high margins, you've got a services person in the property sector, but you don't have... Um, you, know, you don't have a developer or whatever. You have, uh, you don't, or you don't own the, you don't own any of the properties. Yeah. You've got an energy player who actually is just a service provider to the to the energy things. It doesn't actually own any of the assets. You've got somebody in the in the manu- in the industrial thing that's outsourced all the things and they're, and they're just providing services. Yeah. So so it's making sure that you're not ending up owning just yeah. services companies yeah. which something and could happen which, to services companies and, and the thing is we might want to do that yeah. but, but we want to make sure it's a conscious decision yeah. it's not that you're just running a model that happens to put you into one of a certain type that just loves a certain type of company and so that's all you ever buy this is really what this whole thing is about right you look at it from all different angles to understand all the risks you're taking on and to know all the risks you're exactly, taking on exactly yeah so you can manage them you don't mm. want to be unaware Yes, okay. that's right. And so, um, you know, a, a good example of um, where Australians often go wrong is is they um, they go, okay, I've got this diversified portfolio where, um, you know, I own some property, I own some hybrids, I own some banking shares, um, and you know, you go through these, and, and you know, I've got some real estate dot com, and you know, you go through these bits, and you're like, you've got six different flavors of Australian real estate yeah. exposure, yeah. and so yes, they're all in different sectors, and they're all, you know, uh, and and they've all got different, you know, different asset drivers. Types or classes. But, if, but if that one sector falls over, you've lost money on every single one of these. Yeah. And that's where you don't want to be, is yeah. you don't want to be in those types of scenarios. So it's about trying to work out, yeah. Okay. And diversification, I am conscious that we haven't defined that yet on this program. So would yeah. you do us honest? Yeah, basically, uh, is. Um, it's a uh, the best the best example is you're you, you're selling sunscreen and you're also selling umbrellas. So you're at the beach and you know that okay, if it's a sunny day I'm out selling sunscreen and if it's a rainy day I'm out selling umbrellas. Over the course of a year I'm going to sell both of them, okay. but it's not like I'm making all my money in, in one week and, and none of it in the other. So so you've got exposure to different possible outcomes. It's exactly. Just within investing, there are so many different possible outcomes that diversification is often more than just two products. Yeah, exactly. And you want to, you, so you want to have, you want to have things where you're saying they're all going up, but they're not all going up together and all, and all going down together. Okay. So that example I was using of the the person who's invested in all these different things on property, he's saying, well, if the Australian property market goes well, great, you're going to make 
uh, truckloads of money because you've you've made you've, you've basically taken one bet, and if it goes badly, then you're going to do badly. Whereas if you can say, well, I've taken a bet on Australian property and a bit on Australian mining and a bit on Australian industrial, and you know you've taken a whole bunch of different mm -hmm. bets. You know, maybe one will go up this year and down next year, and the other one will go sideways this year and up next year. And you know, it's just that your your whole portfolio is not moving all in one direction at once and all all in other way. Once. The other way. Okay. Mm. Excellent. So, what have we got left up here? Oh, uh, customer types. So, uh, so we look at: um, Are you selling to governments? You're selling to uh, other businesses? You're selling to directly to consumers? Mm -hmm. So, sort of making sure you've got a bit of a mix of that. You don't want to be all, you know, um, you want to be all in terms of selling only to governments or, or only to consumers and, and running into um, your problems when you have when you, you go into lockdowns and all of a sudden consumers aren't spending is that if you've focused all your money on that area then you, you'll suffer more than if you've mm. got a spread of governments and businesses yeah because I guess we went into lockdown and um, consumers started uh, you know, tightening their belts and weren't spending as much. But yeah. governments were, they had all of these programs that they had to do Doesn't as a result out. of it. Yeah. yeah, and also consumers, you know, that came back to our services versus manufacturing. Um, people started buying a lot more goods, mm. but they weren't they buying as many services because, yeah. um, you know, everyone else was locked down Close. and you couldn't, couldn't have the services. Yeah. And so, or at least here in Australia. Yeah, well, and, and, and elsewhere as well. But, you know, so travel, for example, is a service and you, sure. couldn't, you couldn't have you travel can't. services or you wanted to have a haircut or, or get a massage or whatever it is. And there's a lot of lockdowns and a lot of preventions of those. So, um, yeah, so you wanted to make sure, whereas the manufacturing actually, um, people were buying a lot of goods online. And so, yep. um, yeah, the manufacturing actually came up better than the services. Um, uh, customer purchase frequencies, a lot about whether, um, are you selling, say, cans of Coke, where uh, every day you need to go and sell another one? Or are you selling a, a Netflix subscription where you've locked in from month to month? Mm -hmm. Or are you selling a, uh, a software contract to a company that's got a five-year time period? And so you know you're locked away or you've got a you're, you're real estate with a, a five-year lease or 10-year lease. So it's knowing about um, you know, what types of transactional businesses are, are you in. And again, this is not saying one of them is right or one of them is wrong, but it's making sure that you're, you're not running this model that just overly um, biases towards buying a, a particular type without knowing, um, yeah, without knowing that you're actually taking that risk. Okay. Uh, customer for the target um, target market. So uh, there's a depending where companies are listed is not always where they're actually. Um, making their money from, yep. and, and especially once you're looking at large capitalization mm. stocks, which is what we spend most of our time doing. Yep. So, um, you know, one of the places that we've made some good money last month from was um, cement manufacturers, uh, but they're um, they were very expensive in the US. Uh, but you could buy a couple of um, uh, there was a couple of European ones that we bought that were that have big exposures into the US, mm. but they happen to be listed in Europe. So we could we could pick them up 20, 30 percent cheaper okay. than than buying the equivalent US stock, and then you know, get get the good same return. Same exposure. Yeah, same exposure to or, or similar, yeah. similar exposure exactly. Um, uh, so it's, uh, that sort of comes back to currency exposure as well. So yeah, so it's not just it is actually knowing. Um, so in terms of currency exposure, we look very much at uh, the difference between where somebody's doing something, where they're, where they're making their revenues, and where they're making their costs. So what what I'm concerned about is a currency mismatch. So mm -hmm. um, uh, resource companies are probably one of the key ones here where. If you've got a mine in Australia, then your costs are largely Australian dollar. You probably have some some US dollar fuel costs, but your revenues are US dollar based. So, the copper or the the iron ore is priced in US dollars, and so you're getting revenue in one line, and you've got costs in another. And so, if they move in the wrong direction, you can lose out, and if they move in the right direction, you can you can yep. double up. So, so knowing that's the case. Um, there's other ones where manufacturing. Uh, there's some manufacturers say um, uh, a cochlear or a CSL is actually knowing. Okay, well, where, how much manufacturing do they have in Australia, and then where are they selling it to? And so looking at those um, those same types of factors, or or are they companies that actually manufacture in a whole bunch of different countries? And so they say so mm -hmm. they might have operations in yeah you know, six different countries, and they they generally just service their local market. Yeah. Or, or if you're a McDonald's, for example, you know, most of your costs are, are in local currency and you yep. just translate it back. And so knowing which currencies are you exposed to when you really look through to it. And, and that example of saying, OK, I've bought a stock that's in um, Switzerland, for example, but it's a cement maker that's actually global operations mm -hmm. and, and its biggest operations are actually in the US. Yep. And so um, knowing that that's my real exposure, I haven't got a massive exposure to Switzerland. It's, it's I've got a, a company that happens to be listed in Switzerland that's got exposure right throughout. 
Um, but by virtue of owning a stock on the Swiss exchange, you have Swiss franc exposure as well? Yeah, to a certain extent. Um, but what tends to happen in large stocks in particular is that they're bought by global investors who will then recognise that things are going well in the US and they'll the price will so so if you're if you're in that stock and say um, the Swiss franc because uh, really, they have to convert it back to franc and yeah, yeah and right. they're looking at a, a local a Swiss a Swiss company and saying okay here's this Swiss company that's earnings are flat and here's this um, Swiss company that's got sorry Swiss company that's only got Swiss um, yeah. customers and yep. their earnings are flat over the year and then here's another company that's listed in Switzerland, but it's got all these US operations and their earnings are up 10% over the year. Okay, that, that share price is going to go up a lot more Actually, on a relative okay. basis. Mm. Okay, I think that rounds out security selection. Yeah. Um, so I think that I wanted to talk about the economic sort of thematic side of it too, at least briefly, because um, you, you obviously you need to consider how those flow through the portfolios and I think that the model that you've explained for security selection explained to some degree how those will you'll think about them and flow through it mm. but um, you know uh, you, you sort of sum up your whole portfolio and then you look at uh, currency exposure you know, political exposure is a big one that they talk about on a um, economic sort of uh, level yeah sure so um, uh and the other, and some, of, and we also look at the individual uh, ratios that get out. So we see, say, okay, we think we're buying a portfolio. Um, is this that, that's got lots of value characteristics? Is it cheaper than the market once we add it all up? So we've got all these stocks together, we add mm, them all up, yeah. and, and then on a bunch of on a cash flow basis, on a price basis, on a on a on a book value basis, how does it actually stack up versus the market? And and so one of the things um, we were doing, uh, which worked quite well for us last month, was over the last few months, which worked quite, quite well for us for maybe three or four months, is um, we've been looking for more what's called value exposure. So we spoke about what a value stock is. Yeah. Um, they tend to be stocks that are cheaper, and um, when it, when the economy picks up, they tend to perform better. And so they're the, they're the types of stocks we were looking for. And as we looked through our portfolio, you know, there, there was times where we were like, look, you know what, we're actually pretty happy with all the companies we have. But and we, we've diversified and all these things. But then when we, we when we add up the the characteristics, we're like, oh, actually our portfolio hasn't got a lot of value in it. It's actually got you know more average value stocks than it does have have good value stocks. Okay. And and, and we had more high quality stocks than you know th that was the other side of the thing was we ended up with more high quality stocks and and not enough sort of value stocks. And that was uh, the impetus to say, well, even though there's stocks in there we quite like and yeah. and you know that we were sort of happy with the diversification is we want to make sure we we're, we're going to. If, if the economy is going into this uplift phase, okay. is that we've got more value, and that's where we went out and bought the, right. yeah, bought some more travel stocks, bought some more um, cement stocks, bought some more um, uh, the stocks that are exposed to um, employment services and, and things like that. Where the whole idea was for us is that. Um, and, and for some part, it wasn't by, by buying new stocks. It was basically saying, OK, well, there's a stock. Let's go and buy twice as much of that stock and halve our exposure in, okay. in this other one. And at some stage, we'll flip back and, and do the other way around. But it's it's about saying, as I'm putting together a portfolio, um, if you know, if you just start adding stocks you like, the yes. way a typical person does at home, you start adding stocks you like, and you, you sort of look at it and you go, well, I sort of like all the stocks, but should I sell half of that and buy more of this one? I don't know. Mm. Like there's, there's no real reason for it. But if you're looking at all these different factors and saying, well, what am I looking for over the next period, and identifying to say, well, I think there is this up cyclical upswing. We do want more value. Yeah. Okay, now we need to make some changes within our portfolio because of that. Mm. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, that, that was a lot, but uh, I think worthwhile. We can skip on now to the next slide um, and have a, let's use this framework that we've uh, just created to talk through uh, the performance for the core international portfolio in March. Yeah, so I mean, what we're looking at here is um, and it's just some script, some shots from some of the uh, some of the reports which we run to look at where we're getting the performance from, um, and so we can see that I spoke you know about the cement being the well, and the construction materials as being you know that that key one at the top there. Um, we look through some of the individual stocks and uh, in the table below to see which ones are, are performing and not performing. Now. Um, I try not to be too influenced by by stock movements. Like a lot of it yep. comes back to uh, if if we own a stock and, and the stock's just gone up twenty percent in a month, but the earnings have gone up forty or fifty percent, yeah. then it's cheaper than what it was at the start of the month, despite the 
um, yeah, despite price the rise move. in the price. And so um, I actually try very hard to forget where we bought, bought stocks at so that you don't get caught in that whole um, part about, oh, I bought this stock for $20 and it fell down to 18 and now it's back up to 20 I better sell it to get my money back or, 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 or it's only at 19 and now I don't want to sell it because I want to get one more dollar out of it. Try and take that step back to say, no, no, I, I actually just want to know today, how does it sit on a, on a relative basis versus other stocks and how does it sit within that? So, um, but we, you know, you can look at these just trying to say where, which parts of the portfolio are performing well and which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. um, in the parts that are performing well, have they overshot the targets? Okay. So construction materials is certainly one area where, um, you know, if that thing, if those things double and triple, we're certainly not going to hold them. They're not... Okay. They're, 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 we bought them because they're value stocks. They're not hugely high quality. They'll get a bit of growth over the next few years. But not a lot. But, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's time to, time to get out. Whereas there's other stocks that will sit in our portfolio, um, you know, your Apples or, or Microsofts, where very, very high quality stocks earning great returns. And they'll get a little bit expensive, get a little bit cheap. Um, we tend not to try and trade them too much. We buy the high quality ones and like to hold the high quality ones. Okay. Um, and only sell them when they get really expensive. Whereas... If we're buying stocks for value purposes, um, we're much hap we're we're more likely to trade those if they go up. So why is that? Um, so a stock that we bought because it's because um, it's good value now. Uh, we're buying it because we think it's going to revert back to the mean mm -hmm. and and become you know uh, more expensive. Yep. And so when it does, it's time to sell it and go look for another one. For a, for a high quality stock, we're buying that high quality stock because we think it's going to keep being high quality and keep churning out those returns for a long, long time. Okay. And so we put it in the portfolio and we try and hold it as, as long as we can. So if you identify a stock as being value, that you're you're essentially saying that you think it's going to trade within a range. Yep. Whereas if it's quality, the the thought process, and this comes back to what you said before about quality not being mean reverting, is it's just it's more likely to trend up. Yes. So if and you keep were to the sell it, growth. yeah, right, to, mm. to support that trend yeah. up. So if you mm. were to sell it, then you wouldn't expect to get that same buying opportunity lower down that you would on a value stock. Yeah, exactly. And the value stocks tend to be cyclical, and they're, they're often called cyclicals. Mm -hmm. um, is that they will. Um, I will I'll fully expect, say, the cement manufacturers to run up over the next year or two still, and then as um, yeah, as, as the earnings comes through and people start looking at the other side of it, um, they'll start for and more more uh, competitors start coming on to, to chase the the revenue gains. They'll then start falling away, and so yeah, it's a fully expect that to go through a cycle. And just over the next 10, 20 years, they'll be up for a few years. They'll be down for a few years. They'll be up for a few years down. And whereas when you buy a high quality stock, you you buy it with the expectation that they're actually generating really good returns on their on their money, mm -hmm. and they're just going to keep growing that. You know, there might be small ups and downs, but the general trend will be up. Okay. Mm. So, what's a high quality stock in Australia at, uh, at the moment, or has been for the past decade? Uh, CSL. Yeah. It's a very high quality That's stock, but it's so expensive. Um, so we've got a little bit of it, but it's it's just a question of trying to get it at the right price. So that's 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 a good example of one we owned, and the stock price just kept running up, and we eventually got to the stage where we've we're, we own a little bit of it now, but we're, we're very underweight compared okay. to the market. No. And and so um, whereas a BHP or um, any of the mining stocks, uh, I think of as value stocks, they're not particularly they're, they're high quality relative to other miners, mm -hmm. but the mining sector is is very very mm. cyclical. It will go through massive highs and massive lows and, um, and so that's when it, where it comes back to what we discussed before about all of the different factors that you have to consider when you're looking at the stock you know uh, um, what are exposed what sector is it exposed to um, what, what is it actually doing in its business model who's it selling to so on and so forth yep, yep. Yeah, exactly okay um, so um, is there anything else that you think you want to highlight from uh, the international performance this month? Um, no, the other, some of the other stats we look at, which I haven't shown on screen here, but we, we do look at um, uh, a range of other measures that look at the volatility of the portfolio and, and how, it, how it's reacting with the market. So it's something called the beta in terms of, which is basically if the market goes up by 1%, does our portfolio go up by 1% or does it tend to go up by less? And, and same on the, on the downside. And so we look at the upside and downside and, and just make sure that we're, we're trying to create portfolios that can sort of hang with the market on the way up and give you protection on the way down is, is a rough yep. rough guide. And even if we underperform a little bit, you know, if we underperform by um, you know, half percent or one percent on the way up, but, we, but we, on the way down we can save two or three yep. percent, then the net, the round trip is you're in front. So that sounds like that asymmetry again. Exactly. Okay. And so um, and so we'll look at a lot of reports that 
that trying to focus in and saying, is that happening? So that's what we're trying to do. Are we being successful? And if we're not being successful, we need to be, you know, okay, which are the stocks that are doing it? Is there, is that a genuine issue or is it a short-term issue? Is it a one-off? Yeah, every now and again, you'll just, uh, an individual stock might run up or, 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 or fall away and you just need to, um, you know, be aware of, of what that is. And, um, uh, it's it's very important as well if you're trying to run your own portfolios is that um, trying to be just as critical in the period where you did really well as what you did. You know, it's very easy to say, oh, had a bad month mm. last month. I'm going to really look through my portfolio yeah. and try and work out what's going wrong and, and fix it. Um, but you need to really look at your... It's just as important to look at your good months and say, okay, I've had a really good month last month. Was I just lucky? Did I just have a stock that was taken over or something like that? Was there actually, you know, was there something in there that was actually, okay. that really drove that performance? And without that, I need to, I wouldn't have actually done as well. Sure. And so now I need to, I do need to dig in and try and work out what's what's wrong with the portfolio as well. And and, and the other part, you know, you can obviously see some lines going up and some lines going down in those. Um, there are stocks we own with the with a, a view that we might not be right, and so here's a stock which, if we are right, it's going to underperform. So we so we got it right, and we made money on on you know, these 30 stocks we owned, and here's 10 stocks we actually lost money on, mm -hmm. um, and we're happy that we lost money on it. Well, not you know not <laughs> happy, but we understand we lost money on that was their that was their role. Their role was an insurance in there in case we we were wrong on the other ones. Okay, and so. Um, we're not beating ourselves up for for it's only those stocks. Done what you're expected to. I guess that's the thing about uh, finance or, or markets and, and valuing things. Is it's, it's all about expectations, and you hear them talking about this all the time when the economic data comes out. So it's, uh, it's better than expected, or it's worse than expected, and that's mm. what really drives it. So it sounds like it's the same in your portfolio construction. Um, you're trying to determine what the future state is going to be and construct a portfolio from that and there's obviously a lot of different possible future states yes. and if you if you get a few of them right or, or if you guess a few of them and then you do a portfolio for those and then you find that you are right on them and your portfolio does what you expected it to then it's like a tick yes I'm happy with that mm. but then if you get the states right, but your portfolio doesn't react how you expected it to, then it's a cross and it's kind of like, okay, I have to learn from this. Yeah, yep. But it's also, um, yeah, and I, I think the, the other main part from that is always you, you need to be just as aware that, that sometimes you get lucky. And so, okay. and yes. treat the t times when you've done well just as critically as you treat the times when you've done badly because, um, yeah, it's very easy to, to look at a portfolio that's done well and say, oh, yeah, I must be a genius. And then, <laughs> oh, no, it went down, okay, I must be unlucky. Whereas actually, yeah, mm. let's consider the opposite. That actually, you, were, you know, on the, when it went down is, no, you actually did make a bad decision, but also when it went up, maybe you just did get lucky. Okay. And you yeah. bailed out by some sectors. And so you do, maybe you do need to change the, the, the portfolio structure. Mm. So a lot of discipline required in this then. Yep. Absolutely. Mm. So let's move on to the Australian one then. Thanks, Jaden. Yeah, now Australia is... So a similar performance. Um, uh, Australia is dominated by... So BHP on the on the downside. So that, that's one where we were underweight BHP. So even though it was our worst performer, um, we sort of holding holding less of BHP than, than the market. So... Um, yeah, it's part of the reason for for actually outperforming Durant. So there's there's times like that where we're saying, okay, well, we held some of it in case we we got it wrong, mm -hmm. but yeah, we we sort of figured iron ore had peaked, and so um, yeah, owning being underweight that iron ore sector was was a plan, but we yeah. didn't want to have no iron ore because there are scenarios, and we've seen it over the last you know week or two where the iron ore price has come back. Mm. You guys, I so, mean, you guys had a big discussion about this recently on the Investment Insights podcast and the commodity super cycle. Yeah, and you definitely sounded to me like there was a possibility that it could keep going. You, you know, you definitely acknowledge that as a possible outcome. Yes, exactly, and so. Um, uh, and, and the Australian market is just incredibly concentrated in the resources and the banking mm -hmm. sector. And so, and so um, by that, you mean that there is a, a large portion of the ASX 200 mm -hmm. is made up of those uh, Yeah, those so, you, so you add those two together and it varies, but yeah, around 40%-ish you can get That's to. That's huge. But yeah, so whereas globally um, it's sort of... 15-ish, maybe. Okay. So you sort of got th three, yeah, three times as much roughly of those sectors. So, so really getting that in, in Australia, getting that call right is is pretty much the only thing that matters. Yeah. Banks, uh, resources, or, or other, uh -huh. and, and actually in terms of other, we'll usually split into uh, international other and and non-international okay. other. So, yeah. you know, what are the what are the stocks that are actually exposed to offshore? Um, 
whereas internationally you've just got such a, a broad mosaic of different companies all doing different things and, and all these different sectors, um, it's a lot easier to get sort of the diversification and, and measure yourself as a as a broadly diversified portfolio, whereas in Australia there's a couple of big calls which you'll, you'll either get right or wrong, you know, which will really drive performance in Australia. All right. Well, that's been a, a fantastic discussion and I'm really excited to have got into some of the the depths of how you put a portfolio together when, you, when you're investing, as well as helping people understand those things so that when they're reading your um, performance reports, they can take a bit more out of it, hopefully. So thank you for that, Damien. Thank you. Uh, to wrap up the show, uh, if you'd like to hear more from Nucleus Wealth, check out our other podcast, Nucleus Investment Insights, or head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash content. Uh, to stay up to date on news from Nucleus Wealth, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter from our homepage. And I'd like to thank my producer, Jaden Stent, for uh, his work on the podcast today. Thank you, Jaden. And finally, if you know anyone who'd get something out of today's episode, let them know about it, share with a friend, and help our show grow. Thanks again for tuning in from myself and the team. We look forward to catching you on the next one. Cheers.